Hello everyone, welcome back to the second part of the final review uh, for Physics 40B. Um, so for this part, we will be discussing about chapters 20 and 21. And with that, let's begin. So for chapter 20, you guys discussed about the macro micro connection. And here we have two problems that relate to that subject. Uh, so let's begin with the first problem. Problem one, a five liter gas tank holds 1.4 moles of helium and 0.7 moles of oxygen at a temperature of 200 degrees Kelvin, 260 degrees Kelvin. What is the total translational kinetic energy of the gas in the tank? So let's first write what we're given, right? We have the volume, the number of moles for each element or each uh, molecule and the temperature. And we want to determine what that total translational kinetic energy actually is for the entire system. So in uh, week eight, the first part of the video, uh, you guys covered about translational kinetic energy per molecule, but there's actually another variation and it's looking at it in terms of the uh, per mole, which is simple, it's, it's not really that different, it's just a change in the constant. So we actually need to use this instead because we're given all our information in terms of the number of moles. So we simply uh, plug in the temperature, which is 260 degrees Kelvin, and we get a kinetic energy of 3,242.46 joules per mole. But we wanna get the total, right? This is for each mole. So if we consider the total number of moles, right? It doesn't really matter if it's a helium or if it's a monatomic or a diatomic uh, gas molecule. Uh, we kind of treat them all equally. So we're combining the number of moles together and we get 2.1 moles for the total. And this is what we had gained in, uh, we had obtained in the previous slide. And we simply multiply that, right? Because we have 2.1 moles times uh, the translational kinetic energy per mole. So you're gonna get the total uh, amount of energy in joules and that's gonna be 6,809 joules. All right, for problem two, the root mean square speed for monatomic gas at 100 degrees Celsius is 0 0.5 kilometers per second. If the temperature of the gas is now increased to 200 degrees Celsius, what is the new root mean square speed? So we're gonna consider it kind of like two different scenarios. So we'll consider the first scenario, scenario being 100 degrees Celsius and its respective root mean square speed as 0.5 kilometers per second. And uh, the second scenario being 200 degrees Celsius and we wanna determine its speed. So before we begin, we wanna first convert of the values to standard SI units, just to be consistent and not make uh, any like mistakes. So we do that and we wanna go back to our root mean square speed equation. So that equation is shown here, square root of three times Boltzmann's constant times temperature divided by mass. So when we consider these two scenarios, we're gonna assume that both of these scenarios uh, doesn't have a change in the mass. We're gonna say the mass remains constant. And in this entire equation, right, the Boltzmann is also a constant and mass is, we're gonna say, is also a constant as well. So we're gonna actually uh, isolate for mass. So I'm gonna square both sides and I'm gonna isolate for that mass. So why did I do that, right? I wanna look at a relationship between temperature and the root mean square speed because those are essentially the variables that are changing and they're uh, related to one another. So if we see that there, the temperature is proportional to the square of the root mean square speed, right? We can write it in terms of T1 divided by V1 squared is equal to T2 divided by V2 squared as shown here. We already know like the most of the values, so we can simply solve for the root mean square speed at scenario two. And it ends up being 
three meters per second. Next up, we'll be covering chapter 21, and that involves heat engines and refrigerators. So for this problem, it's a very lengthy problem, and I'm gonna go through it to the best of my ability. So let's begin. Uh, consider the heat engine below. This engine uses a monatomic ideal gas as a working substance and a cycle consisting of two isotherms and two isobars. You are given the information in the chart. So we can see from the graph, right, the two isobars, if you remember, are the horizontal lines in a PV diagram, right? Because pressure remains constant, so it doesn't change, and that's where the flat line comes from. Whereas if we look at the isotherm, it's a bit more complex. It's a complex curve. Um, as you can see, uh, from one to two, it's a, it looks different compared to three to four. So we kind of have to figure, figure that out too. So if we look at what we're given, we're given at point one, we're given P or pressure, volume, and temperature. And for volume, uh, it's given at points two and four. So let's actually go through um, all these uh, parts one by one. But before we actually can do that, we want to actually uh, get more information or extract more information out of what we know. So we know that there's going to be two isotherms and two isobars uh, in this cycle. And we can infer that if it's an isotherm, right? The temperature remains constant from those two or from those two processes, and in this case, uh, isotherm is occurring at one to two. So that means the temperature is remains the same uh, for both. So in this case, the temperature at point two is four hundred degrees Kelvin, which is the same as point one, and the same can be said about the isobar from four to one, right? So we know that pressure at point one is 10 to the five pascals. And therefore we know that pressure remains constant. So it is also that same value at point four. Uh, the things that we don't know is um, the pressures at two and three. We just know that they're equal because it's an isobar and temperatures at three and four just because they're an isotherm. So um, just going back to this summary of ideal gas processes, we're looking at table 21.1 in the textbook. I just wanna highlight um, the two equations that are gonna be important for the next couple of steps or parts to solving this problem. So just highlighting these, uh, you'll be using this in the next couple of steps. So the first question is, how many molecules of gas are used in the engine? So I highlighted, uh, point one specifically because they give the most information. So just to remind ourselves, right, we want to determine the number of moles N and we could simply use the equation PV equals NRT. And we're using point one because it gives us the most information. So N is equal to P times V divided by RT. And we substitute all those values in knowing the universal gas constant and we get the number of moles being 45.1. Now we want to determine what the pressure at point two is. So how should we approach this? If we want to determine what that point is, we can consider looking at one and two because we can see that most of the information stems from that area. So we know for an, that uh, from one to two, it's an isotherm so that the temperature remains constant. So that means we can use the relationship P1V1 is equal to P2V2 and we have a majority of those values given in the chart. So when we substitute all those values in to solve for P2, we get a value of 300 kilopascals. So if we know that two to three is an isobar, and we stated before that P2 is equal to P3, then that means P3 is also 300 kilopascals which is highlighted in yellow in this section. So the next part of the question is asking, what is the temperature at point four, right? 
So we want to find that. Um, so what we can look at now is we can consider the isobar at from four to one. So if we say isobar, right, it means pressure remains constant for those two points. And we can derive the relationship from the ideal gas law as V1 divided by T1 is equal to V4 divided by T4. So we have, like I said, the majority of the values and we can just solve for T4. So that ends up becoming 533.33 Kelvin. And we know that it's an isotherm from three to four. So that means T3 must equal to T4. And that mean, also means that the temperature at three is 533.33 degrees Kelvin. So which is filled up in this, these two slots in the chart. So next is asking the question, what is the volume at point three? So we're filling up this last slot in the uh, chart. So, we have a lot of information. We can do it different ways, but I decided to choose an ISO, looking at the isobar from two to three. So we're using the same relationship once again, and we're just solving for volume at point three because we have all the information that we need from the chart. So in the end, the volume at point three is 0 0.666 meters cubed. So this should be what your completed uh, pressure, volume, temperature table for the cycle lo should look like. And next, we want to determine with the work done by the gas of the different processes and what is the exchanged heat Q for the different processes. So when we consider work and uh, heat, we have to consider the different processes from like one to two, two to three, three to four, and four to one. So for each, so this is a chart that should be created when you're solving this problem. Um, we'll be going through this step by step, but once again, we have to go back to looking at the summary of ideal gas processes chart. So next, I've highlighted the work section. So you're considering the isobaric, right? Remember what work is. Work is the area under the curve. So iso, isobaric means it's just the area of a rectangle. In this case, it's P delta V. For an isotherm, it's a bit more complicated. It's equal, the work is equal to NRT times the natural log of the final volume divided by initial volume as shown here. So we'll be using these two equations specifically to solve for the work for each process. So let's go through this. So isotherm, we're using that equation. That's very complicated. And we just plug in our numbers, right? We have the chart. We know the number of moles uh, from part A, right, is 45.1. And we know the universal gas constant. And we, I just put in T1, but you can also put in T2 because they're the same temperatures. And you know, I'm getting a value for work as negative 165 kilojoules. For the isobar, or process two to three, it's pressure times the change in volume. And we have those values. It becomes 50 kilojoules. And you kind of just repeat the same process, but for with other values for to complete the entire cycle. So in this case, your volumes are different, your temperature is different. So that means your work is also different, but the equation is still the same. So work from three to four is 220 kilojoules. And then for the isobar, work is negative 50 kilojoules. So I just filled out the chart or updated it. And now we wanna to move to figure out what the heat Q is for each different process. So we're gonna go back to looking at the table and I've highlighted once again, the equation that you have, the equations you have to use to solve for heat Q. So for the isotherm, um, Q is actually equal to, or the heat is actually equal to work. And you can just write as simply as that. For the isobar, it's governed by this equation, uh, NCP delta T. And CP is actually, um, derived from CV, right, specific heat or at a constant pressure. 
uh, but you need constant volume first. So we know for a monatomic gas, it is three over two times the universal gas constant, but there's a relationship between CV and CP, and you're just adding an extra R. So in the end, CP is actually five divided by two times that universal gas constant. So you do that, you plug your values in, and you get heat from two to three is 125 kilojoules. With the isotherm from three to four, uh, once again, it's just Q is equal to W, and heat is 220 kilojoules. And for the isobar uh, from four to one, you're using that same equation. Again, you're just changing the uh, temperatures, right? And you get negative 125 kilojoules. And it should kind of make sense that the isobars are essentially, are, are essentially opposites because the temperature is equal and opposite for the temperatures that were given in the chart. So you can see that this one's positive and this one's negative. So this is the filled out table. And we can see here that this is the completed table for heat, work and heat. So we want to continue forward and we want to look at efficiency. But you know how efficiency has to deal with uh, output or the work that comes out, uh, the heat for the, um, the heat engine and the hot and cold reservoirs as well. So you need to consider those values, but you can't, you don't really know those values just yet, but you can actually obtain them from the chart shown here. So the work that comes out from the cycle is essentially the net work of the entire system. So you're summing all those works for each system, so like one to two, two to three, three to four, and four to one, and you sum them all together and you get your work out. And that becomes 55 kilojoules. For the heat coming from the, po or from the hot reservoir, it's actually the positive values of heat in the cycle. So in this case, it is from two to three and three to four. We, we add those up and that heat becomes 345 kilojoules. On the other hand, right, uh, heat in the cold reservoir is actually taking the magnitude of the sum of the negative uh, heat values. So in this case, it would be one to two and four to one because those are the negative values. So taking, the, taking that magnitude, you get uh, heat from the cold reservoir is 290 kilojoules. So next up, um, we want to determine what the efficiency of the heat engine is. And we just use the equation, eta is equal to work out divided by heat from the hot reservoir. And that gets you 15.9%, right? So you can also drive another equation just to make sure that you've been doing it right. Uh, eta or the efficiency is one minus heat from the cold reservoir divided by heat from the hot reservoir. And it's just one minus 290 divided by 345. And it also gets you 15.9%. All right, I know that was a very lengthy problem, but hopefully that helped you in understanding actually how, in actually understanding how to actually solve these problems. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to comment down in the description down below or, you know, just shoot us an email. Uh, with that, I wish you all the best of luck on your final exam. And thank you for attending this review session.